government were getting away with the line for month after month on the television. It's a uh, terrible crisis. We're terribly sorry about it. Uh, cuts have to be made. You all accept the cuts have to be made. Which ones would you like? That was the dialogue. That was the whole national conversation for month after month. That's gone now. Now the conversation is, does this have to happen at all? Aren't there alternatives? All the things which actually relatively small numbers of people on the left were saying, it should be Trident that's cut, it should be the war that's cut, the banks do have the money, and so on and so on, is now mass political dialogue uh, in this country, and the student movement has done that. <coughs> so it's a, it's a dramatic change of political direction, because um, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students <coughs> have taken action which has altered the whole political nature of the, of, of, of the, de of the debate. And it is, as Claire's described, an incredibly uh, dynamic movement. It's involved very, very large degrees of spontaneous mobilisations, particularly amongst the, uh, amongst the school students. I mean, no mobilisation is ever completely spontaneous because it relies on previously accumulated but dispersed forms of knowledge, one of which, by the way, among the school students was certainly the experience of the Stop the War uh, coalition and the memory of that, and indeed in some cases the, the people involved directly in it were related to the Stop the War coalition, so it's never completely spontaneous, but there's a very large element of spontaneity uh, between that, and you can see that across the, across the demonstration. The first demonstration, um, the one that was officially called by NUS and, and UCU, was a huge demonstration which involved some thousands, I'd say four or five thousand people within it, you know, uh, deciding spontaneously or more or less spontaneously or through the sheer anger of the, uh, the demonstrations to go for, go for Milbank. The two subsequent ones, I would say, I would say that demonstration was probably 80% student lecturers and 20% uh, school students. It was still a very high mobilisation from, from nothing. The two subsequent ones, I would say, were overwhelmingly school student uh, uh, school student demonstrations. So they were, they were school students uh, in their majority. They were largely at all. I mean, I was down in Trafalgar Square when that one assembled. And I mean, what was happening was a, a cross between a mob and Beatlemania. You know, at any moment, out of some side street or another, another sort of massive group of school students would arrive with their homemade placards, simply screaming, running into the square, embracing another set of school students, forming a human pyramid on the on the cliff. I mean, there was no, there was nobody in the square, I believe, actually had a megaphone. Certainly nobody <laughs> had a PA. When it decided to go down Whitehall, it just decided, like some sort of giant animal, that it was going off, and that was it. And so it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't a. Good, uh, an organised political expression in, in, any way what's, in, in any way whatsoever. Now, I think what we did with the final demonstration, I think it was absolutely the right thing to do, was to fuse those elements together. We intervened in that process to pull the de demonstration together. You know, Claire and Yulu and all the rest of us and the occupations, which were a very important part of that, because they, you know, they don't hit the headlines. Uh, we shouldn't imagine that actually uh, 30 or 40 universities going into occupation is a minor thing. It's not a minor thing. It's a huge wave of occupation. It's the biggest wave of occupation for a generation in, in higher education in this country. And it gives the it gives the whole movement sort of focuses for organisation. It gives it depth. It gives it the ability to articulate politics over a long period of time to a key group of actors who transmit it to others. It politicises the movement. It gives it a theoretical framework. All of which is as important as the mobilisations on the streets. And in the demonstration, the last demonstration. Those elements really fused, uh, fused together. And although there was all the anger of Real Bank and all the anger of the other ones, it was actually, you know, more or less an organised political uh, demonstration which had some form and some shape and some demands, and people were uh, organised to come on it and so forth and so on. And I think that's uh, a very important dynamic to understand how it shifted between initial forms of official organisation with unofficial action, unofficial forms of organisation. I mean, outside the official NUS UCU structure emerging from that and beginning you know, to debate and argue and, and, to, and to relate to the uh, spontaneous action of the school kids uh, and others. So that's the sort, sort of dynamic which is, uh, which is, which is running now. Now, I don't think anybody really, I'll be honest with you, I don't know, I don't think anybody really knows what the next step is likely, is, is likely to be. I don't think anybody can say now that there will definitely be another demonstration like these ones in, in, in January. That's not a safe prediction uh, to make. For this reason, really, the people on the demonstrations are, are highly political and have got very 
clear understanding of what's being done for them. And it's not the case that you can simply mobilise students again and again on the street, run them against the state machine, and hope that the next time they'll just come back for more. That's not, you know, that, I mean, it's a, it, as everybody knows, this has been a, a bloody, I mean, you can tell from the atmosphere in the room for the people who have been involved in this, it's an exhausting uh, experience uh, for, uh, for, for activists. It's, it's, it's draining, and the state is directly using methods to batten people off the street. I mean, and in one case, I mean, in Oxford yesterday, I mean, perhaps people have seen the story, I might have heard directly from somebody in Oxford, of a 12-year-old who was trying to organise a picket of David Cameron, that the police got him out of school, intimidated him to texting around his mate saying that it was off, took him back to his home, lectured his parents. Now, you know, this, you know, this process is, is, is going on. All I'd say about this is it begs, in a very, very forceful way, um, uh, the question of how do we organise for the next stage of the movement? What will be the next stage of the movement? And anybody who thinks, simply thinks that you could call the next demo and the next demo and go on like this, as if repetition was strategy, I think it's just, it's, just, it's just not thinking about the political effect of what we've done so far and what the forces are ranged against us and how we should, uh, and how we should uh, uh, deal with them. Now, I, I just want to say one thing about this. I think that the crucial question, now that the legislation has passed a vote in Parliament, the crucial question in the next term will be the question of how you make the higher educational, uh, uh, how you make higher education institutions in this country ungovernable until the vice chancellors and the principals say to the government, you cannot go on like this because we can't run the universities in this way. They are simply closed. They simply won't work. There's too much disruption. We have to break it at the point where the educational sector can't be sustained in the face of government legislation. And in my view, the critical aspect of that, I'm sure people will call demonstrations and demonstrations will happen and they may be successful or they may be smaller than before. But the critical thing is here, whether or not you can get a nationwide wave of indefinite occupations of a mass character which go, as only a few have now, for the central registry uh, the central office functioning of the university sector. And I think that's a debate that we should put forward and say, this is the critical next step. You know, you can back the demonstration off, off the streets, but it's a whole other thing to try and send the police in, start dragging people out of occupation. That, uh, when, when UCL briefly tried to close down the whole campus, the staff were absolutely bonkers at the administration and say, you've got to stop this now, call it off now, and within an hour, it was called off. And that gives you some sense of where the different dynamic from a wave of occupations could come from. So I think that's one argument that we have to put, uh, that we have to put very, very, uh, very, very clearly. I also want to talk a little bit about an argument which everybody in the movement has now, you know, have been addressed in, in some way, and Claire, you know, quite rightly referred to it, and that's the relationship between the student movement and the wider, uh, and the wider working class movement. Now, um, there are a series of arguments here from the, from the old left, and a lot of people on the left in Britain who've been around for a very long time who understand correctly, theoretically, that workers have more power than students. This is absolutely ABC, of course this is absolutely, uh, absolutely true. That if, and this is also, either as a generality, absolutely true, if there was strike action by any serious group of workers, and in particular if there were general strike action, this would finish the government in a way and in a time scale that the student movement on its own couldn't dream, uh, couldn't dream of achieving. Now all these are, you know, universal truths commonly acknowledged. So, but the difficulty is that a universal truth implemented in a particular circumstance can turn out to be wrong. You have to get the mediating link between what's generally true and the actual concrete situation in which you exist at the moment. Now, let me just deal briefly with the argument about the general strike, because it's around. And lots of people outside the organisation, they find it attractive, because what it's really saying is, you know, they, they absorb it at the levels, we really want to get you, you know, we really want something big to happen, because I'll really fuck the government, and that would be an absolutely brilliant thing. And at that level, I haven't got any objection to, uh, to it. It's a, as a sort of spontaneous cry of anger and desire for mass action on the part of workers, fair enough. As an actual practical proposal, of course, it's absolute nonsense. And I'll tell you why it's absolute nonsense. If you're serious about general strike, that is, if you are serious about the idea that every major union in this country will simultaneously 
bring workers out on strike, you are talking about a, situa a political situation which is one step short of what in the Marxist tradition is called dual power. That is that the government of the country is divided between the official ruling class and the working class movement and the institutions it, uh, it has created. There will be a conflict between the state power, which will make anything that's happened in the last few days look like a picnic, as it did in 1926 or in France in 1968. You will have to be talking about seriously arming workers, about workers' militias. Now, these, if you, if you toy with the idea of general strike, but don't take it seriously, of course you don't have to think these things through. But if you really mean it, that would be the situation which you are saying, A, the British working class is about to do, and B, these are the measures that we would have to take. Now, once you begin to phrase it in these terms, I think you begin to say that we are some distance from this actually being the circumstance in Britain. And the trouble with it is, it doesn't just sort of think pass by as kind of good idea, because whilst you're calling for a general strike, and people say, well, you know, what's wrong with it? Maybe it isn't realistic, but hey, you know, it's not a bad idea. Why don't we just talk about it? It gets people in the right frame of mind and so forth and so on. Actually, what you're doing is you're not talking about the actual concrete practical steps that you should be taking in order to actually take the struggle, as it really exists at the moment, one step further forward. Now, what would be, in our current concrete circumstances, a one step further forward? It would be surely... If the UCU, which is a lecturer's union, and the NUT, which is a teacher's union, actually took some form of action alongside the pupils and the students who are now taking action. Closing down the higher education sector would be a dot if there were just one day of official strike action by the lecturer's union. Defending the school students would be over as a political issue if the NUT backed them for a single hour on a working working. Day. Now that's where we need to focus the anger. And I, you know, I find it actually close to offensive when a member of the UCU London region spoke to <coughs> a demonstration in Mount Street and said, I call for a general strike. And what I want to shout is, you can't get your college out for half an hour. So don't lecture all the rest of us about a general strike. You're hiding behind a call for a general strike. You're disguising the fact that you're not actually fighting your own union executive, which is a left-dominated executive, about what they should be doing in support of the students. And that's where we have to focus the argument. We have to start saying, even if activists in the NUT, and even if they can in the UCU actually win this, they should be putting around petitions. They should be passing it to their branch. They should be pressurizing their union executive that this is what we think needs to be done. And that would be a serious, practical step forward which would advance the actual level of solidarity which now exists in a practical and organised way between the students and the lecturers and the teachers and would have an overspill effect on the rest of the on the rest of the trade uh, trade union union movement. But until that happens, the truth of the matter is it is students who are in the vanguard of this struggle. Students and school students are the people who should be deciding the next step and they shouldn't have to decide it by reference to people who aren't yet acting in solidarity with them. You see, there's two views of unity in the, in the, in the struggle. I was always taught. One is the unity of the graveyard. You know, everybody's united in the graveyard. They're all equally dead. Nobody's doing anything. They're all equally passive. It's the unity of the lowest common denominator. It's the desert caravan that moves at the pace of the slowest camel. But the class struggle isn't like that. The class struggle moves when the most dynamic the most militant, uh, the most mobilised, the most politically conscious uh, people struggle at the highest level and then demand from the people behind them they catch up. That's how real solidarity takes place. Nobody said to the miners, oh, you've got to move at the pace of NACOS, which was the, the supervisor's union in the pits. No, they said, we're striking, you catch up. They didn't say to the dockers, we're all going to move at the pace of the dockers. They said, oh, the miners are striking, you catch up. And that's the way in which, practically, a vanguard of people in struggle relates to other, other sections, and we have to have that mentality. And besides which, actually, to put it in, in blunt terms, I wouldn't even mind the argument going around in the student assemblies that workers have got to come to them. Of course, I agree with that. I'd even agree that they should participate equally, if what was happening was this. If we held a student assembly and through the door, there came 10 bin workers from Hackney brought down by their shop steward. If there were 50 lecturers from the local college brought down by their union reps. If they were standing in that room 
alongside the socialists. Of course, I would say you should have an equal voice. That's not what's happening, though. What's happening is one or two left sects are sending along their representatives with absolutely nobody with them are demanding that they tell the students how to organise their struggle. Now, that isn't unity between students and workers. That's the left. Don't <coughs> dictate to a live movement how it should behave when actually the live movement knows very well or has got very good ideas about how it should behave. And we have to, I think, protect that dynamism on the part of the, on the, part of the, uh, of the student movement. Um, final point I want to, uh, want to make is about the sort of the, the longer shape of the struggle because I think, I think lots of people in this room have played a terrific role in the struggle and I think it's done terrifically well in the size occupation and Claire's done a brilliant job and all the students have done a brilliant job. But also we did a very, very important thing in the same period when we established the Coalition of Resistance and held the Coalition of Resistance conference because you know, it's a huge conference very diverse, lots of very new uh, people uh, in involved in it. And if we're going to talk about a practical, national, organised framework in which unity between different sections of the class and the student group and the school students is organised into a single force, it's going to be in that, in that framework. Building that is now the practical, organisational expression of that, kind of, uh, of that kind of political unity. And we've got some big tests coming up, you know, We'll be into Christmas very, very shortly, and we'll be out the other side and halfway through January, and then there will a lot of people say, shouldn't the TUC have called a demonstration earlier than March 26th? I'll tell you, March 26th is going to look very, very close to us, very, very quickly. And that demonstration can be an absolutely devastating uh, uh, demonstration. It can be a demonstration that's as large as the anti-war demonstrations, but it won't be that without a hell of a lot of ground-level work. Without a lot of activists, a lot of towns and cities, booking the coaches, selling the tickets, getting the union money, getting the unions to agree to send delegations, getting the students to organise the college to have delegations on that. None of this will happen just naturally and in the way of, uh, uh, and in the, and in the way of things. So that's a huge task. Core decided it's going to have a week of action in mid-February. It's kind of springboard towards March the 26th. And as a part of that, have a London... Uh, a London-wide demonstration, which I think actually is the next place that we ought to seriously be thinking of a kind of united worker and student mobilisation during, uh, uh, during that week. These are very, very important staging points. If we get them right, we can arrive in March with having built on the student movement, with having mobilised very serious numbers of trade unionists and working class people in a mass demonstration of an entirely different scale than anything that we've seen since the very biggest of the anti-war movements and the government, which let's face it, we said it was a weak government, but for the student movement on its own to have smashed up the Liberal Party, to have got it down from 22% to 8%, I mean, much more of this and they'll be lower than the Greens in the, in the opinion polls. I loved Nick Clegg's, Nick Clegg's speech where he said, we must move forward in unity, when actually his party was split in three different uh, directions at the very moment he was uttering, uh, uttering uh, the words. Uh, for the Conservatives at any point to lose the Liberals is to lose government. It's not like a Thatcher government, it's not like a Blair government with massive Commons uh, majorities as the, vote, as the vote showed. We can be a very, very long way down the road to smashing up the government if we get the next six months right.